Hey everyone, this is Kit Cabello with Hard Lens Media. I want to thank all our viewers and subscribers for tuning in. This is a very special interview that we are conducting here with Priti Upala. Uh, she is a, a former investment banker, um, Bollywood actress, as well as uh, Miss India, as now, and now currently a political commentator and blogger. And we're glad to have her on the show. She actually did a two-hour interview on the Convo Couch, which was in which she was being interviewed by Craig Passa. I urge all our viewers and subscribers to check out that full-length interview. But I think the purpose of this is to really uh, speak about, you know, U.S.-Indian relations and, of course, the consequences and aftermath of certain dis uh, political policy decisions that are being presented by corporate media. And so I really want to give uh, Priti Pala to, uh, a chance to introduce herself and really tell our viewers and subscribers just about who she is and what she's about. So Priti, please take it away. Namaste, everyone. Thank you so much for having me on Hardlands Media. It's such an honor. Um, yeah, I'm a former investment banker from, you know, grew up in Dubai in the Middle East, lived all around the world, uh, moved to Europe and then Australia, and then finally New York and LA. I've been to close to 100 countries and speak five languages. I work as a multimedia entrepreneur here based in Los Angeles. I have my own radio show called The Eternal Hour on iHeart. Um, radio, uh, I heard radio. I'm a political editor and analyst for various publications all around the world. And uh, I am also an international speaker. I speak on, um, actually not on politics, I speak on spirituality, philosophy, and purpose um, to large think tanks and, um, you know, uh, top 500 CEOs and stuff. And um, I'm just, my passions in life are traveling as well as uh, spirituality. Mm -hmm. So I'm just honored to be here and I'm very knowledgeable, particularly with politics um, of the subcontinent and my speciality as far as, as, far as my reporting goes um, is geopolitics, international affairs, diplomacy, and uh, counter-terrorism measures. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a brief introduction uh, of myself. Okay, so we here at Harlan's Media, we're very critical of CEOs and think tanks, so uh, you're kind of in the lion's den in regards towards progressive independent media because, you know, this is who we are and what we're yeah. about. But, you know, it's very interesting that you, that you got into this and uh, really what kind of led you away from Investment Banker to be more of commenting on politics and geopolitics and, of course, international politics? Yes. A uh, very uh, good question. First, just to, to touch on, uh, I mean, you can be a CEO of a philanthropic organization as well, and they are very, there's a lot of other good kind of companies out there too. So you, you have to be more, uh, expand your horizons as far as what, uh, you know, uh, the think tanks and also these think tanks are are not corporate as much as they are uh, social and we speak about language and culture and actually salvaging those things uh, you know that sort of stuff uh, so uh, you know working in the corporate world was um, I mean so on paper sounds fantastic but it was very unfulfilling for me I knew that my life my dharma my purpose in life was much more than just being in some corporate office somewhere in Sydney Australia I just knew that I belonged on the global stage to do more to affect the masses at large and share my message and uh, I, I mean this is several years ago and my sort of spiritual journey was starting at the same time as well as a corporate role was ending I believe I just through my own kind of deep contemplations and so on, I realize that I'm better off uh, being elsewhere, doing something that I actually love to do. I love to communicate, I love to engage. I'm also artistic and creative. So that was a natural sort of um, a path towards uh, uh, you know, film industry and uh, all of that good stuff, uh, photography and all that. So it all came very naturally. I studied acting in Sydney and I worked there before I won a scholarship to come to New York and study film. And I just knew it was a sign and uh, you know, got, got myself a one-way ticket and left everything behind, moved to the other side of the world because I just, had this strong conviction that I can do much more for the world and my happiness and fulfillment actually lied uh, or, or lies in the service of others and in really you do, you using my full potential. Okay. So that's what brought me out here and it's been quite a journey. Okay, so now um, 
you know, especially on the interviews, the Convo Couch. Again, very interesting. I do uh, ask our viewers and subscribers to check that one out. It's also on the Mikasa Sukasa Network. Um, you did talk a little bit about, with Craig, uh, U.S.-Indian relations, and I just want for you to just expand on it a little bit more because, as we all know, there is an election happening here in the United States. Yes. And, of course, Modi has been brought up and his relationship with the United States. So yeah. I really want to get your comments more of, these, uh, at least during the early years of the Trump administration and maybe even yes. looking into previous administrations in regards to the relationship with India and Modi and where it stands right now. Because at, at one point, there, there was conversations brought up about Modi, and now he's yeah. just being mentioned all over the place, mostly because of Representative Tulsi Gabbard, because she's in this yeah. primary race. So really, let's actually talk about U.S.-Indian relations. Um, what was the initial uh, relationship like, at least in regards to trade and economics, early on before yeah. Trump even got elected? Interesting. So the U.S.-India relation uh, ship is a very interesting one. It certainly evolved over the last 20, 30 years, I would say. Um, you, I think this current administration, it's we're, we're seeing a new chapter in it. Thank, actually, in, in I would say that's uh, that's better for, for both countries. So um, I really believe that the world's largest democracy and the world's oldest democracy uh, ought to be friendly with each other, not adversarial. So I think if the leaders of these two nations have you know, genuinely warm relationships uh, or relationship with each other, it actually helps both countries and the world uh, at large just as a result. Um, now, you know, the uh, Indian diaspora, so the Indian American community, I don't know if your listeners know this, but they make up a tiny, tiny uh, percentage of America. It's 1%. So, however, this tiny group also happens to be the most educated and the richest ethnic group in the country, um, even including uh, white Caucasian Americans. So it's a tiny group. However, they do have this enormous, uh, you know, I mean, being the most educated and the wealthiest and also, uh, you know, they have a, a large disposable income as well. And they are very generous. They are known to, uh, because of their own history with democracy, they really are engaged in democracy. They do vote, they do speak out, you know, and they fund and support, um, uh, you know, candidates that they like, parties that they like. And they've done that, I think, through the last uh, several decades. So this relationship, um, you, you know, it's funny because on paper, you would say that they are perfect allies, right? They're both democracies. They both believe in um, similar values and their moral compass is, is similar, you know, uh, importance to family, tradition, uh, fiscally, both are conservative in, in their own ways, uh, you know, sort of, um, uh, liberal values, freedom, they're both free societies, uh, free market, capitalistic, a minimum market economy in the positive sense. Uh, so, you, and also uh, the most important, I would think, is that they're both fighting towards this, uh, against this um, uh, global terrorist threat. So on paper, you would say, hey, these guys should be best friends. But sadly, that's not been the case. And uh, I must say the culprit here, at least from the Indian perspective, has been the U.S., um, I wouldn't even say U.S.-Pakistan relationship, but I would just say consecutive governments, U.S. governments have propped up and funded the military dictatorships in Pakistan. And this is a known fact. So when you do that, it... Uh, we suffer the brunt of that because a lot of that manifests in cross-border terrorism. This has been going on for 70 odd years. And uh, so for us, we, we feel that we are doing everything right and we don't you know, invest and harbor and breed terrorist, terrorism. But yet we look at what the US is doing vis-a-vis uh, Pakistan. And I think the relationship ha had been uh, I think there was no trust there because from our perspective or the Indian perspective, it's like, hey guys, we're the good guys here. You know, you, you should be teaming with up with us, but yet what are you doing sort of propping up these, these um, you know, these despots and, and look at what they're doing to their own country and worse, look at what they're doing to Americans in Afghanistan. You know, the studies have shown that the Pakistan Taliban and, you know, the 
Pakistan military ends up actually killing a lot of people, a lot of the U.S. troops in in Afghanistan, right? So, and they know this. For foreign, you know, there's foreign. The American Foreign Office is well aware of all of this, but yet they, despite to despite that, they still continue to, you know, sort of prop these. Uh, prop up these dictatorships and terror is a you know kind of turn a blind eye I think even when it's terrorism towards their own people so that has had a strange effect um, with the India US relationships however I think this government is a little different and we are seeing uh, some changes okay. and whether it's just yeah. Okay, because because there's a lot to unpack there. Because of course, right now, uh, yes. unfortunately, there's a growing conflict, or at least somewhat the beginning of an escalation between Pakistan and India. Which hopefully yeah. that does not take the case, because both these countries have yeah. uh, severe military uh, firepower. And if it, anything were to escalate yeah. beyond a point of no return, it could be devastating yeah. for the entire international community. Yes. And one of the point of uh, uh, that that's really boiling this uh, conflict is the future of Kashmir. Now, of course. There are U.N. forces there, yeah. or at least a U.N. presence there right now. Yeah. And this conflict does require international intervention to, to some degree, or at least a presence of the international community, so it doesn't go beyond the point of no, no return. Why is this actually happening right now? And currently, why did India, at least at this point, uh, order for some of its forces to go into uh, Kashmir, which is right okay. now designated so as, as like an independent territory? Absolutely not. I think everything that you've just said in the last minute or so is completely, I don't know where you're getting your information from, but it's actually quite mis misreported. So I'll, I'll clarify everything and I'm happy to that I have the opportunity to do so. Um, so firstly, the escalation will not come from India because in the 70 years since partition, India has never instigated a war with Pakistan or any other nation. But Pakistan, on the other hand, has instigated four wars uh, they lost all four of them and they continue to sort of invest in terrorism and and so on so the the uh any whether nuclear or not nuclear or any terrorism it, it comes from this is not a two-party dispute or a or a situation where there's two countries that are at it it's a situation where one country consistently for 70 years because they have nothing else and part of their identity is that we are not india and we're not you know hindu we are this Muslim, islamic the theocrat and you know we do it uh, things our way and we are better um, and i mean they've invested in terrorism it's the only nation in the world that uses terrorism as a diplomatic tool for statecraft and and that's that's a huge statement but that's the sad truth so the escalation will come from that side not from india i think india has um, we've bled a lot, you know, uh, the motto of the ISI, which is the Pakistani army and intelligence is to bleed India by a thousand cuts. I mean, this is their official motto. So uh, that's what they're working towards. And all we can do is defend ourselves. So firstly, Kashmir um, is not an independent um, a disputed territory. It was a part of India for thousands of years before the British ever invaded. And uh, uh, when the partition happened, every single uh, princely state in India, um, there were about 550, I think, odd at the time, they were given uh, an opportunity to pick between India or Pakistan. There were a, a handful that went with Pakistan, but the overwhelming majority, so like 540 odd, actually chose India, which again is very telling. But Kashmir was one of these states that was uh, making up its mind. But when it got invaded by Pakistani um, military, because it was one of the largest Muslim uh, majority states in India and Pakistan just assumed that because it was the Muslim majority state, it should go with it. Uh, I mean, that's not how these things work. I mean, there are other Muslim majority states that didn't go with Pakistan, but they had their eye on it uh, for a long time. But anyway, when it didn't go uh, with it uh, or it, the, the leader at the time, Raja Hari Singh, was still deciding, they were invaded. And that's when the Raja Hari Singh went to the government of India at the time and said, we need your help to fend off the terrorists. And so the Indian government said, oh, absolutely, we will do that. But you have to make a decision wh which way you want to go. And uh, that's when it uh, decided to accede to India. So there is a formal um, 
uh, it, it integrated to India. It merged with India, just like every other Indian state. So Kashmir is as a part of India as Mumbai or Delhi or Goa. I think people, this is a very important point that people need to uh, sort of appreciate and respect. Uh, and then, you know, it merged with India. And then there were other laws that came in after that to give them some breathing space. Um, th these laws were not bought in by the Indian government, by the way. They were bought in by the person who became the chief minister of Kashmir at the time, Sheikh Abdullah. And that is a, a dynast. Uh, uh, he and his son and grandson ended up ruling Kashmir for large part of, you know, the last 60 years or so. And it was for their own financial gain, they decided to introduce these laws, which sort of uh, closed it off from the rest of the country. So it was like within the country of India, it sort of had its own laws, but it was very much an Indian state because they vote for Indian parliament and so on. Okay. So, so that's a. Yeah. All right, but, but seeing how corporate media at least, you know, at least yes. portrays Modi and his administration, because this was yeah. obviously India, the prime minister yes. at the time, or as yeah. it is right now, is Modi. And. Of course, yes. uh, there, there's a lot of things really unpacked in regards to dealing with him because he's he's due with some criticism, especially towards some of his policies that he's implemented in the past. Uh, what would yeah. it really take then to really de-escalate the situation to where perhaps it's back to where it was initially at before India went into uh, Kashmir at this time? Okay, so you're making a lot of assumptions that are coming from sort of a false place to begin with. I mean, it's a part of India. You can't annex yourself. All right. So it's a law that. So firstly, let me let me explain to your viewers what happened on the fifth of August. So let's get a few points straight out of you know out of the bat, or else it's pointless uh, to sort of you know people are talking about some symptoms and they don't even realize what actually happened. So number one, it's an integral part of India. Uh, the bill that was passed uh, to revoke these two articles was done in a completely democratic fashion. Uh, was it uh, went through Parliament both upper and lower house where actually this government does not have a majority uh, people overwhelmingly voted for it they won it passed with two-thirds majority which shows that um, every the, trust me the whole country and including a lot of people even in Kashmir and the surrounding areas we have been waiting for this for 70 years it's just and also it was a temporary and transient law which should have been removed 70 years ago but it was kept in motion uh, because some of these political parties in Kashmir were financially benefiting from it, and it was a venomous rhetoric um, that they used to spew to keep themselves in power. And so, so the only people who are upset with this uh, revocation of these articles are terrorists, separatists, insurgency groups. Um, and Pakistan, that's about it. So it, the whole of the U international community, including the EU, including the US uh, and the UN, they have backed India. It's an integral, um, it, it's an internal matter in a sovereign country. I think enough, uh, th there has been, of course, some correct reporting on that done as well. So you have to understand that. Uh, and also, the, the, so the troops were sent in because the, there would have been an outcry from all the terrorists present in Kashmir. And this, these are some of them are separatist groups, and a lot of them are even terrorists that come in from the border. So you have to understand that when you take away the arm that feeds terrorism, um, you know, they're go there's going to be an outcry. So the blackout or whatever, there's no curfew, by the way, but whatever per perceived, you know, image of a, a clampdown, it, it did not happen for the people of Kashmir. It happened to sort of curb some of the terrorism. By the way, in the last month or so, I think there's been only two fatalities reported, and both right. of them were killed by Pakistani terrorists. So, so, so there's something I, I do want to bring up, though, in regards towards yes. uh, at least U.S.-India relations. Uh, you yes. did actually write an article in which you were critical of Modi and President Trump meeting at the G7 summit. Uh, essentially, I would like you just to go a little bit more in detail, yes. but really why you were critical of that, because let's let's face it, no matter what, I mean, the, Internet, the United States is a global yes. superpower, similar to the, uh, yes. all the other members of the G7 summit. Uh, yes. Why is it that you were then critical of the U.S., uh, or at least President Trump and Modi, yeah. meeting and speaking to each other? No, I wasn't critical. If you read the article, I wasn't critical of the meeting. I was critical of 
Donald Trump saying things like, I'm ready to mediate. Uh, no, by the way, the, when he made that statement, I think every diplomatic in the in the world uh, had a like a trigger because everybody, anyone who's involved in foreign diplomacy, or and certainly in America, will know that uh, anything to do with Kashmir or uh, between India and Pakistan is a sort of a bilateral issue. Uh, a third party actually doesn't have the jurisdiction or jurisprudence or legitimacy to. Uh, you know, to, to intervene. There has been uh, uh, agreements like the Shimla agreement, but there have been many more uh, where all the parties agreed that any issue between these countries will be dealt with internal, I mean, b amongst themselves. So uh, when Trump says things like, uh, I'm ready to mediate, well, no one asked him to mediate, number one. And I think if he was referring to Modi asking him to, to me mediate, that is, uh, that would, that's a lie. I mean, he did make a fool of himself, I must say, with that issue. He absolutely backed, I mean, he took it back. He, you know, and then after, at the G7, he was very, um, uh, sort of warm and cordial, and he sort of said, "No, India's got this." You know, well, so I think he got the message that he needs to back off. So that's the I, I, my criticism was that you can't. There, there is no legitimacy to to mediation. Now, what he could do, being the superpower, and if he does want to act as the police for the world, and something that he should have been, I mean, something that America should have been doing for decades, is to ask Pakistan to stop investing in terrorism, to get rid of their. So, I'm not sure if your viewers know, but Pakistan actually has training. Uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda training camps. This is well known. I mean, anybody who works in this area of counterterrorism knows that they are the largest state-sponsored terror factory on the planet. And now we are getting uh, reports that even the 9-11 attacks had the Pakistani links to it. Every ISIS or Islamic um, terrorist act that happens around the world, surprise, surprise, you can trace some of it back to Pakistan. Where and by the way, Osama bin Laden was not hiding in Tehran, Iran. He was hiding in Abbottabad in Pakistan. I think it's very important for people to op open their eyes, wake up, and smell the coffee, and know what's happening in terms of um, terrorism, uh, Pakistan's sort of uh, push for it. Mm. Uh, but so, so Trump did backtrack, and now... Uh, you know, so I want to touch on this huge event that happened uh, called Howdy Modi in Houston, Texas, uh, just uh, recently. Uh, it, this was the largest uh, political gathering of uh, people on U.S. soil for a foreign head of state. So second only to the Pope's visit, this was uh, uh, an event thousand. And uh, 60 lawmakers, I believe, including the mayor of Houston, uh, senators, uh, you know, Congress people, and of course Donald Trump. So it's a rare uh, occurrence when the president of the United States is a guest um, in his own country um, at an event for 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 another head of state. But it was uh, quite the sight. I don't know if you got a chance to see the highlights, but I urge people to, because it was wonderful. And I think it... Okay. All right, so uh, real quick, uh, one thing I do want to just at least touch base on is that at least how corporate media has been portraying Modi or any of his, uh, or his, or his ideas and policies, he's been portrayed as a nationalist. Now, the thing is, what I want to hear from you, and at least, you, at least t for you to describe to our viewers, is what is the real definition of an yeah. Indian nationalist? Because it's being thrown around. Um, yeah. What is that? And then how would you be able to, I guess, de define it, for, for uh, at least for our viewers? Yeah, sorry, my phone actually just cut out, cut, got cut out there for a second. I just want to complete my thought, if that's okay. Okay, go ahead. So the, yeah, so the Howdy Modi event, a uh, huge event, uh, a big victory for the Indian American community, who are really a pillar, I think, um, for this Indian-U.S. relation. Because uh, you look at this group, they are, uh, you know, the model citizen, the success story of immigration. They pay their taxes. They work hard. I think the Indian or Hindu representation in U.S. prisons, I don't know. It may even be down to zero percent. It's a tiny, tiny amount. You compare that with 
other groups, other faiths, and it's much larger. So here's a group that's doing everything right. They are proud Indians as as much as they are proud uh, Americans. So that was a huge victory for both these countries, and they, both the leaders on stage made a. Um, they spoke about get, getting rid, rid of poverty and prosperity, and most importantly, fighting global terrorism. Uh, and Modi did um, this whole rally uh, for two things. One is, of course, he wanted to interact with the Indian Americans, who are huge supporters. Uh, I mean, he's massively uh, popular both in India as well as outside. He is the most popular global leader, I would say. Because right. 384 but, million people voted for him, so yeah. So, so, so the thing is, though, uh, at least how corporate media has been portraying Modi, though, or at least been and talking about him, is in regards that he is a nationalist. Now, there's a lot of things to be. Well, there's there's a lot to be critical of 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 Modi, especially of his administration, especially yes. early on before he became the prime minister of India. So the thing is, I, I think it's very important to at least get the, the idea and the definition of what what at least yep. since since you talk a lot about Modi a lot, what is the definition. No, of, no, it's of, of, of an Indian I nationalist. I just wanted to, to, to touch on that event. Right. Yeah. But we so so yeah. yeah I would just like uh, for for at least to get a definition of what that is, so that our viewers can at least get an idea, because this is being thrown a lot at, and a lot of people yeah. who are unfamiliar with Modi should be aware of what, I know. what, what is what is what is that term? What is an Indian nationalist then? Yeah, I mean, this is so funny because before, uh, past a few years ago, nobody knew what any of these terms meant, you know, and le even many Indians didn't know. So it's surprise, surprise, suddenly this happens and then everybody wants to talk about something that they don't even know about. Uh, it's a bit shocking. Okay, okay are we still with the signal? All right, um, so right now we're still trying to fix the signal up. Um, it's not coming through. Um, but I think it's very important that we have these kind of conversations and at least talk to people with different perspectives. Um, yeah. All right, hang on. Yeah, so all at right. the turn of the century. Um, and uh, so, I'm, I'm sorry, so, we actually did lose contact with uh, Yeah, with yeah, we signal. did. Yeah. <laughs> so I would, I would just at least like for you to, I, and I'll just ask the question again. In yes. regards towards Modi, um, corporate media is calling him a nationalist. Yes. And I at least like for yeah. our viewers to understand, at least from your yes. point of view, your perspective, what is the definition of an Indian nationalist? Because, yes. you know, this is this is being thrown out. Uh, uh, I know. at least in our media, especially with it's this been, presidential election cycle, with, as well as future yes. international relations. So with, let's with get Western to that. media, with, with sort of subversive Western media outlets, it does get thrown out a lot. So I'd be surprised if if uh, if there was a citizen who wasn't a nationalist. I think I'd be more concerned if they were the opposite of that. So the Indian nationalistic movement uh, started during uh, the when the British were, uh, op, you know, invade had invaded and illegally occupied us for 250 years. It was a movement that was against them and wanting to boot them out. So a lot of the free original freedom fighters uh, of India uh, were a part of this uh, sort of Indian nationalistic movement, people who are very proud of their Indianness and uh, wanted to have self-rule, uh, you know, and Gandhi, of course, who is, you know, people want to, you know, uh, sort of uh, discredit this term. Well, Ga hello, surprise, surprise, Gandhi was one of the greatest nationalistic leaders of India. And you can say the same for a lot of other people. Uh, freedom fighters and a lot of people lost their lives who are part of this um, movement. It's about uh, honoring your culture, your traditions, your language, your ethos. I think we have our dharmic uh, framework, which, ha you know, I don't know if you guys know this, but the Indus uh, civilization is the longest uh, continuing unbroken civilization in the world. And a part of the reason for that uh, is this ethos that is um, deeply rooted in um, dharma, which is about ahimsa and truth and uh, nobility um, and, and, you know, being vegetarian and all the things that comes along with sort of being Indian or being, you know, part of Sanatana Dharma and so on. So it's a beautiful thing. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But the Congress Party, which came into power after partition, they were, they had this sort of distorted a uh, post-colonial hang-up, and they wanted to be something that they're not. They wanted to to 
sort of they wanted India to be something other than what it really is. And part of that uh, is their own post-colonial indoctrination. And we had for 60 years, we had this Congress party in rule. And while they were there, they introduced a perverse form of secularism, which, it, you know, is was like uh, destroy the majority and appease tiny minorities and so on. And it was something that didn't work for the country. They were also highly, highly, uh, they loved the Soviet Union style of governance. So it, the India almost went bankrupt in the 1990s, thanks to their uh, fiscal policies as well. So all of this sort of ties in. So uh, the, um, some of the most uh, proudest Indians would call themselves Indian nationalists. I, I mean, I, like I said, I think I'd be more worried if uh, if you'd be opposite to that, I mean, what? So you hate your country because, believe me, there are uh, people in it, and also here that uh, that sort of they hate the idea of America or they hate right. America as such. And in India, you have these subversive people so, that so, will burn the flag and so on. So, so then there's another perspective to really bring into this, yes. and that is, okay, you, there's Indian nationalists, but then there's also yes. Hindu nationalism. I think it's very yes. important that we at least get an understanding of what that is because yeah, again very, because again yeah. the united states you know most americans yeah, don't, are aren't familiar with relationships with pakistan yeah, and, I, I agree, and india yeah, so fine, what is fine, what is hindu but, nationalism then yeah Can so you when describe what, that? I, all this Absolutely. All this time when I've been saying Indian nationalism, I am talking about Hindu nationalism because you have to understand that India uh, firstly has been Hindu for five, six, seven thousand years of its existence, the, the civilization and uh, Hinduism is not a religion. It's beyond a way of life. I think it's really a, a knowledge system or, or really beyond that, it's a civilization. So Hindu nationalism is 85% uh, of India, even today, is Hindu. So you have to understand, again, that the very fabric of this country is rooted in a certain kind of uh, dharma, in a certain kind of you know way of thinking, and so be it. And that's uh, one that has, that it's thrived for so long, and that to trying to do it the right way. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, it, it's a good thing. It's just sad that uh, th th this, um, Rhetoric started actually in India by people who didn't like these uh, very proud uh, nationalists and citizens. And also, they when you support the Congress, you're I think supporting a, a, a different ideology than than this nationalistic view. So you there there's so much. Um, sort of anti-state, anti-majority religion um, sentiment that was coming from the opposition, and because they also ran all the media houses, and there was such a you know quid pro quo going on there, uh, this uh, sort of vile, uh, disgusting rhetoric uh, that Hindu nationalism is is a uh, violent. Uh, it started from India and then got co-opted by their Western uh, sellout, subversive Western counterparts that we see here. And that's why you see the headlines that you see. Nobody in India actually takes them seriously. But right now, I think they're very disturbed that these is, you know, a country like India, like I said, uh, like I mentioned before, has not attacked anyone, is not known for terrorism, is known for yoga and meditation and spirituality and vegetarianism. and true secularism, by the way, uh, that they are getting bandied, uh, tarnished and uh, our faith um, in the global narrative of, uh, you know, uh, religions to having done a lot of damage. You look at the Abrahamic monotheistic religions and then you look at Indic faiths, including Buddhism, Sikhism, Jainism and Hinduism. Uh, I'm sorry, but they're you can't even they're not even on the same league. So it's uh, it, it's hurtful for even people like myself and a lot of Indian Americans to hear this uh, talk. Right. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's just shocking, actually. And I think a lot of them are genuinely very confused and baffled. So, so then, uh, then this leads into another thing in regards towards uh, Modi and his government. Because, you know, it, yes. we, when we look at our world leaders, you know, we have to be critical yes. of them. We have to, you know, be yeah. and look at them through at least a different perspective. Oh, yeah. So when it comes down to identifying Modi and his government and his regime, is there anything that you are critical of his current policies, both nationally and internationally, in regards towards India as a country? I think he's such a great ambassador, which is great. 
you know, he's but, someone but, but to who be is, critical yeah. of him, though. No, no, but but I'm saying it's like such good PR work and stuff. He, you know, me, I think I'd like to see better trade deals, you know, including with the U.S. I mean, we we you know we it's a huge market and we have the right to sort of uh, be more demanding. I said, or or, or just negotiate better. Uh, I think we as 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 a country, our own foreign policy as well needs to change. I think we are um, sort of still allies with some actors that maybe we've outgrown that relationship. I think we, just like the U.S. needs to assess who its friends and allies are, I think this current government also needs to really look at, uh, you know, who its friends and allies are. I think we should be doing a better job at maybe defending ourselves, not just militarily, but, you know, I shouldn't be... Uh, I'm not a spokesperson for, for the government, by the way. Right. I but understand here I am having a conversation with you trying to uh, you know uh, d d debunk some of these uh, these these false rhetorics you know what they should be doing that to be honest i think they need to be more proactive um especially we i think india just as as a people is not very good at internationalizing or politicizing anything and we have so many so many good things we can politicize and internationalize and they are you know there's uh, we are bombarded with terrorism that we could speak more loudly about which we never have even at the un we never had and i think this government i think people expect more uh, to sort of take a, a stronger stance uh, you know, in all that way. Also, I think uh, this government can do better with uh, sort of, um, we have, you know, when our constitution was written, a lot of them were sort of um, uh, founded upon, we, we used the, the British constitution as a template, but it's, these are different nations. You know, the penal code are, are different, you know, uh, uh, like gay uh, sort of sexual criminalization is not an Indian law, that's a British law. So before the British came in, we were, you know, very pro LGBT or trans and all of that good stuff. But it's the British Penal Code that criminalized it. So that got put into our constitution that only recently got changed. So it doesn't actually. I don't think our constitution reflects uh, Indianness or Indian thoughts and values. It, some of it is very British and it doesn't apply to us. I think this government can do better with looking at some things that don't serve us as a people. Right. And uh, yeah, get rid of the colonial hang-up. Right. I think you can stand on, on your own two feet, right. you know, with your own civilization. So, so and I think it's also very important to get this other perspective as well, and yeah. that is in regards towards India's government, because corporate media is only, at least the media here in the United States, yes. we're, they're only going to focus on Modi, but then let's yes. actually talk about the BJP and its role yeah. in Indian politics and how in some areas it's, it's maybe a little bit different uh, in regards to how it implements yeah. its policies or how it represents its constituents. So yes. what is officially the role of the BJP, and is there anything to really be critical of it because like like everything everything is open for criticism and to be you know taken apart yeah so firstly there's a myth that we have a far right or a center right government in india there is no right uh government in india they, we only have an anti-left uh so it, it's it's interesting. I think people need to really know that right off right uh, off the bat because the policies of the so-called far right government in India even today would put uh, socialist, democratic, progressive parties um, in the West to shame with their welfare uh, schemes and their affirmative action initiatives. It's a, a joke to call even the, in fact, if anything, the Congress is the GOP of India because they've been, they were the first party and they ruled India for 60 years, ran the country to the ground. It was a dynast corrupt party where it was one family that pretty much ruled. And this family also had this, I mean, one of them was an Italian for God's sake. So uh, they even had these colonial um, sort of a, uh, post-colonial um, ideologies of what India should be, which did not work, and uh, people were fed up of it. So BJP is very new. Um, funnily enough, it is the largest and the most powerful political party in the world with almost 200 million um, card-carrying members and so many more who are not members, but they support it. So BJP, again, even the name, I mean, you look at India, National Congress. 
Okay, so again, and you look at BJ. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to ask you to to kind of repeat that because your signal is kind of going a, out. You know, it's a Hindi name. It just means, but in itself, I think, is very out of um, the custom of their, uh, you know, uh, all of. It. Okay, let's let's get back to this. So uh, right now, our signal is kind of going in and out. We do apologize for that inconvenience. Um, but again, this is why we have Hard Lens Media, so we can interview people's different perspectives and really kind of get an idea. Because let's face it, corporate media is obviously has its narratives, and there's things to be critical oh, yeah. of it. All right, so great. Okay, so you're back. So um, real good. So uh, I think uh, what you can uh, what you can do. Can you please just give your last statement again? Because you were kind of going in and out. Yes. So just to uh, just to add, uh, the the BJP is the largest and the most powerful political party in the world with 200 uh, card carrying members and so many more who just support it. And you could just see it in the name, the Indian National Congress versus the BJP, which stands for Bharatiya Janata Party, which is very telling because it's a party that's for the people, for the poor, and uh, to just uh, protect and harness Indian culture, values, language, cuisine, uh, secularism in its best form and uh, it really is just uh, the whole country as one uh, and one nation one constitution one anthem one flag okay. so that's the BGP uh, in, a, in a nutshell right so now there's also been a lot of talk of how Democratic leaders have met with Modi in the past most notably yes. Nancy Pelosi and John yes. Kerry now of course these are two yes. key Democratic lawmakers and this was way early on before anyone I think here in the United States was aware that Modi was even Prime Minister of India yeah. any kind of executive leader of India yes. so no one was really familiar with it but because of this 2020 election cycle and the way yes. the media wants to portray candidates mostly yes. progressive and independent candidates one candidate's been targeted in particular has been Tulsi Gabbard so I really want to yeah. understand when the Democratic part at least when has this idea narrative really shifted towards you know viewing any kind of meeting with a world leader because that's what you're supposed yeah. to do in Congress especially in our Congress to be more specifically and that is meet with foreign leaders meet with foreign diplomats and speak to them in regards to trade relations and other yes. economic uh, trade relations that we would have with other foreign powers so at least in regards towards Tulsi Gabbard because he did uh, talk a little bit about Hindu nationalism yes. and Indian nationalism yes corporate media has been saying a lot of negative smears about her yes. Is Tulsi Gabbard, at least from your perspective and how you defined Hindu nationalism, is she that or no? Well, she's a Hindu. She's a practicing Hindu. I think if you want, she can't be an Indian nationalist as such. You'd have to be an Indian, you know, person. So it's interesting that before Tulsi and before Modi, nobody knew about any of these things that we just discussed. Mm -hmm. um, and suddenly she comes up on the scene and you're looking for her to to destroy your your competition and 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 you pick up the most obscure thing about someone which is their faith which is an intimate part of who they are and in a um, in a world where there is so much um, the, the, you know there there are so many problems that we're having with religion but uh, the more violent barbaric regressive forms of religion and you you know you look at the sharia law and you you know we have a apostasy laws there and they're completely they, you know they throw off their lgbt people off of buildings and yet no one wants to bring that up but you want to bring up something obscure like hinduism it's right. a bit rich so 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 then so then just to clarify because again there's yeah. there's a lot of, there has been a lot of negative articles about tulsi gabbard you are yes. basically saying that she is not a hindu nationalist well, not she's Indian yeah, he, but, but, but of course, but of course, she's Hindu. Yeah. I mean, that is her face. I mean, she's she not was, Indian. She's, yeah, she's a Samoan American. So yeah, yeah she. Comes, uh, th so thank I, you. I, yeah. So the, the the couple of points I wanted to make is one number one that's her personal faith she's absolutely allowed to you know and I think when people uh, if I mean if you want to have a, a, a if you have a problem with someone's personal faith especially a faith like Hinduism I think you should have an even bigger problem with Congress people trying to uh, you know who are not uh, uh, sort of don't have a problem with things like uh, FGM and many other regressive uh, uh, barbaric violent laws and somehow through the back door very subversively kind of trying to bring in Sharia type aspects and we're seeing this sadly in, in in the American Congress so I think people need to really wake up and know what the problems are because uh, you can talk about obscure little things that are of uh, you know anything about Hinduism or India will not uh, be of consequence will not affect America but anything to do with what the other 
that I just described absolutely will. Mm -hmm. And I think people need to wake up and look because the problem is really staring at you. Um, right. on your so, face. But, and just but, to but, but basically to get to the downtown point, because the reason yeah. why I brought it up is because yeah. uh, recently there was an NPR interview where basically oh, well, the interviewer NPR was was, was okay. like uh, was was tearing apart, was basically going after and smearing Representative Tulsi Gabbard and True. her family and her and her religious practice. And I just wanted to get yes. the clarification because because we've had a very interesting conversation in regards yeah. towards. Hinduism, Hindu nationalism, yes. and Indian nationalism. Yeah. I'm glad that we at least get down specific. So, I mean, there we have it. Like, you're, you know, it's I just a, wanted to add, just so your viewers know, NPR has been known to be very Hindu phobic and had serious anti India sentiments for a while. Recently, one of their producers, I think she was a Pakistani, I could not tell. Uh, her name sounds like she could be uh, a producer on NPR. This is, by the way, you could Google this. I urge people to. She had put out a disparaging, vile, disgusting tweet uh, insulting Hindus. And uh, she. there was so much outrage about that tweet that she apologized and they fired her. So NPR is known for this. And even after the firing, this particular NPR in, uh, second interview with Tulsi came up and um, I I, I give it to Tulsi for taking these difficult interviews and she I'm sure is doing some of the things that I'm doing which is trying to kind of debunk some of this stuff and just to add to her she as a uh, I, I see her as uh, someone with very good foreign policy skills and and diplomacy skills she, you know I think a leader of the free world like America should be having conversations with all foreign leaders and they should be diplomatic and so on so I don't see her uh, anything wrong with her being talking to and being friendly and also i think with india there is that uh she has a deep bond with with india just from her own faith and she's critical as well of many different uh, aspects of indian government and so on but there's nothing wrong with her um, associating uh, you know with someone like modi and modi by the way is not in the same league as people like putin or you know bolsonaro and all these uh, real fascist or real right-wing governments uh, or racist governments or the Chinese dictators. You know, I don't think Modi even is in that same league. And I don't think India is, when you talk about bad actors in the world, uh, I, I don't think that India is the, the big culprit that, uh, that anybody has ever pointed to, nor should they. So I think we need to, uh, you know, really have a, a be honest do some uh, i think the dnc needs to do some soul searching because a lot of these attacks are really coming from that area i have not seen anything from the right on this at all in fact there's plenty of uh, people who uh, you know sort of um, don't have an issue with her and, and are even giving them a giving her a fair platform to sort of talk about policies and these various issues mm -hmm. So and then uh, then going forward uh, in regards towards, I guess, this election cycle and really just yes. more of like nearing the final of, of this interview, um, there will be a new president or perhaps President yes. Trump will be reelected, depending on yeah. how things happen with the Democratic primary yeah. and who's a challenger. But, you know, those things are not certain yet. But in regards towards future relations with India, I mean, of course, India is also there's going to be an election up, happening there as well. Uh, what That's is the potential? five years from now. Uh, of course, five years yeah. from now, of course. But there's always talk about the next yes. election cycle and people oh. always like to hype it up. Um, yeah. What will be the future of U.S. relations with India going on after this election cycle in 2020 then? What are some of your concerns? Excellent question. Um, this 2020 election, I think, will be the first time that the Indian American community, I think their voice is, is going to be uh, more valuable than it's ever been. So they have traditionally voted Democrat. They're very loyal. And, you know, they, they're very wealthy. They have a lot of disposable income. They sort of fund, uh, uh, you know, candidates and so on. They're really supportive in that way. But I think in the last few years, some of this sort of the very negative, uh, vile rhetoric that has been coming from the left, you know, to do with all of these things that we spoke about, it would make the Indian American really think about who really has your interests at heart, um, because this whole Kashmir issue, unfortunately, uh, has brought up 
uh, two options on the table. You got like, who do you who, who do you want to believe? You want to believe the largest state-sponsored terror factory in the world, which is Pakistan, or do you want to believe a country like India, whose greatest export in the world is spirituality and has never invaded another country? I mean, this is it comes down to that sort of base level. And with the DNC, uh, some people in the DNC going on about this, uh, including Bernie at at this. Um, rally that he spoke at without knowing the uh, issue of Kashmir. He has a Pakistani campaign manager uh, who fed him what he w w wants to be told out. And so Bernie had just parroted that being very reckless. And I think there was a lot of outrage in the Indian uh, American community about that. And you really ask yourself, I mean, if you want to side with the enemy, it, I'm sorry, but w why would we vote for you? So I think there's uh, a lot of people will either be uh, go down the middle, they won't vote, they'll, or you're seeing a massive push where people do think, you know what, the Republic, Republican Party on issues that matter to us, they actually uh, are sort of, they're not adversarial to us. They have not been problematic. Uh, so I think the DNC needs to do some serious soul searching uh, with these issues, because I think the very, um, all these smear campaigns that they're, uh, want to pedal, I think it's actually going to come back and bite them because uh, it's not just the Indian American community that can see all of this. I think this stuff is very obvious. I think there's a lot of people, Indian and non-Indian, who are looking at the circus that is the DNC, including the establishment Democrats and this sort of pro-war stance that they have. And people are just, and you look at these debates and it's, it's a circus and you think, you know what, do we really want this? I think there's a lot of talk about that. And uh, I think some of these democratic you know count congress people that are without again without under appreciating history and not even understanding pakistan's role in the global terror terrorism narrative uh you know and if you want to make statements like that mm -hmm. i think you're really shooting yourself in the foot okay so it's a time for i think reflection for everybody concerned Okay, and I think that's a perfect note to end it on. So I guess for our viewers and subscribers, because I think this is more of an evolving conversation that yes. later on more people are need, need to be more aware of, especially as yes. uh, more people get curious about our relations with foreign powers, yes. whether it's India or any other country out there. So I guess for our viewers and subscribers, since you're a blogger, you're on social media, where can they learn yes. more about you, find you online and on social media so that they could you know, find some of your work? Absolutely. I love to be engaged with, sort of my fans and, and supporters and listeners. So you can find me on Facebook. I have my profile page. It's just Preeti Upala. Uh, please find me. Twitter is Preeti Upala. It's, I got two U, so it's U-U-P-A-L-A. -A. Instagram is Preeti U. I have my own website. It's Preeti Upala.com. Uh, I write for about 15 to 20 um, international outlets. Uh, just please just Google my name and just type in journalist or article and all of them will come up. Uh, I write for Jerusalem Post, Times of Israel, Times of India, The Observer, um, and Indian Defense, and so, so many others. Uh, but YouTube, I have my own channel, so please look me up. Just just uh, on the search bar, just type in Preeti Upala interview or whatnot, and all of my pieces, my interviews will come up. Um, and my blog will be on my website, too. Uh, uh, but just reach out, you know, and i uh, love to hear your opinion. And uh, and oh, you can email me too if you want directly. It's misspproductions at gmail.com. And uh, thank you for having me. I would love to come back at another time, whether in, in studio and next time I'm in Chicago or next time you're in LA. We'd love to meet in person and do, do another elaborate conversation like this.